55. There is a sun shining within you. It is the presence of Christ in your heart. Do not let the clouds of a bad mood, rebelliousness, or dissatisfaction obscure its brightness. The light that comes from outside shines, but it casts a shadow when confronted with an obstacle of any kind. Your inner sun never provokes darkness because it illuminates from inside to outside in abundant jets. With love as its fuel, your light will become more and more powerful, shining blessed in all directions. So let your light shine everywhere. So join me in this opening prayer. Let's give thanks to our divine creator, to our spirit mentors. We ask that you guide our speaker this evening and may each one of us have open hearts and open minds and be present here in this moment to hear about today's parable, the parable of the wedding feast. We thank you, dear God, for this moment to be together. And may you also send loving vibrations to those who are watching. Well, we thank you and so be it. All right, everyone. Um, you know, Leo has been doing a... a a number of different parables, and this week is there. This month is the parable of the wedding feast. Leo, hello, and good afternoon, everyone. Then you can hear me. I want to make sure that I take my notes because there will be a lot of questions today. Hope you guys study the uh, the passages that I sent to you. Everybody's asking, what passage? What are you talking about? <laughs> no, it didn't happen. It's just a joke. It's like, I didn't get it. Didn't get that memo, Leo. Sorry. But, folks, I'm happy to be here again. Um, as Kirsten said, I mean, we have started this, um, embarked on this journey to um, learn from the teachings, Christ's teachings, actually. And um, it's, it's um, we have thus far um, talked about um, parables um, only. Um, and as we progress, we will talk about um, not necessarily parables, but moments of Christ's uh, life and teachings that not necessarily was um, prescribed by him as a parable, right? And um, this one here too, uh, we will talk more about it, is one of the Parables that is on the gospel according to spiritism. I think I have done three thus far that is actually in the gospel of according in the gospel according to spiritism. Not to make our lives easier as a speaker, uh, because the Kardec brings a lot of information uh, when it is study on uh, the gospel according to spiritism, but because Kardec picked, um, let's let's put uh, topics to be discussed that it was not controversial, that it would truly help humanity uh, to progress. And that's why uh, we try to make it easier on the, on the listener, on the audience, because it is something tangible that we can pick up, right? And say, okay, let me go ahead and study. Does, does uh, what is what Leo um, saying make sense, right? Um, do I need to study more? Or does he need to study more, right? I need to hear from you guys. <laughs> But that's one of the reasons we pick these um, these um, parables, these teachings that is on the gospel according to spiritism. Nonetheless, it's not an easy thing to understand, right? Um, we're going to read together. Uh, we're going to try to make sense out of it, the information there um, with our understanding. Most importantly, what I would like to ask everyone is to apply this to our lives. Really, really, really um, apply th this teaching to our lives, right? On how will this make my life use more, more, how will this make my life, uh, uh, let's say, if anything, happier, right? Um, or make myself a little bit more responsible, whatever we're trying to achieve, which I believe that it will guide us in anywhere or any way you choose. So the parable of the wedding feast. Unfortunately, the picture that we brought um, is not so well there on the, on the, um, on the screen, um, little yellow show, whatnot, but definitely I can share with you as well 
um, send it over to you. Well, the, ooh, I don't want to turn it off and on. And ooh, I'll send it over to you, by the way. <laughs> and if you actually see it online, it will be a little bit better for sure. But this parable, it is um, uh, the one that we will focus is actually on Matthew uh, chapter 22, verses from verses 1 through 14. But it also can be found on Luke 14, verses 7 through 14, right? The interesting thing is that Matthew is very aggressive with the words, right? When you go to Luke, and you, if, if you compare the, the Gospels, you will see that Luke um, is that young heart, right? It received the, he received the message, and he didn't, I shouldn't say that, but he has... Um, a more compassionate heart compared to the other gospels, right? So if you, uh, and this is something that I've been uh, I've been learning um, on my own as well as I have heard of other um, scholars, if if you will, on on the gospels that, depending on the gospel, even though they're talking about the same thing, perhaps you know they were um, bringing a parable, you will see that there are some variations and some different ways to bring that information. Nonetheless, the, the two of them are very effective, and we're going to stick with the uh, the one that is actually on the gospel according to Spiritism, which is yes, uh, the little you know a little bit more harsh than the other the other ones. If anything, when we're studying parables, I like I always like to say this is that we want to make sure that you know we take the parable um, and really study as well the context. Who was Jesus talking to? Where was he? What are the elements that are being used? And we're going to go through it um, um, quite a bit. I want to make sure that I watch my time as well, even though we start a little bit late. But all right. So the parable um, of the wedding feast. Let me ask you this. Who has here studied the parable or read before? Okay. All right. right. And that's fine. I mean, and, and, and it can be also, um, um, uh, let's say, confused with other ones as well. But we're not going to go there. Let's not forget ourselves, uh, lose ourselves. So what is, the, what is the parable? I'll read slowly and I'll take my time because it is quite a bit. But let's try to dive into it, right? Let's put ourselves into the whole that is happening, right? We already know it's a wedding feast, right? So speaking further through parables, Jesus said to them, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who, wanting to give his son a wedding feast, sent his servants to call on those whom he had invited. However, they refused to come. The king then sent other servants with others to tell the invitees, I have prepared the feast. I have slaughtered my cattle and what I have ordered to be fattened. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. However, they were not concerned, and one went to his house in the country, and another to his business. The other seized his servants and killed them after having badly mistreated them. When the king found out, he was filled with anger, and having sent his armies, he exterminated those murderers and burned their cities. He then said to his servants, the wedding feast has been fully prepared, but those who had been invite, invited were not worth of it. So, go to the crossroads and call to the wedding feast all whom you meet. His servants then went into the streets and gathered all those who they met. Both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with people who sat at the table. The king then entered to see those who were at the table and noticing a man who was not wearing a wedding garment, he said to him, My friend, why have you come in without a wedding garment? The man remained silent. Then the king told his servants, Bind his hands and feet and cast him into outer darkness. There, there shall be weeping, of, weeping and ganishing of teeth, for many are called but few are chosen. It's like, wow. Right? I mean, poor everything. <laughs> right? It's, it's tough. It's a, it, it, and reading it out loud, 
every time you do so, it's like, what is Jesus talking about? Why was he, he so harsh with the whole scenario? It's like looking at, at um, a 2023 movie, right? That we go and watch the movie, all the craziness that's going on, you know, that goes on. Um, people killing one another, right? The denials, you know, the and, and all is about a wedding feast, right? And the one that actually goes, he's like, you're not worth of it. Send him to the dungeons, right? So it's like it makes you think. Perhaps the first thing, the first reactions that we have is that something very negative. And it is. And it is, right? But why is it negative? when we're only talking about a wedding feast. If anything, a feast, right? We'll talk more about that. I just want to get these ideas out there, um, uh, the joy, the excitement, the, the perception of that the, there is um, people being murdered and all these things, so we can actually digest, right? And make sense out of it. As you've noticed, uh, perhaps the... On this um, slide over here, we actually put a picture of the gospel according to spiritism because I want, I, I, once more, I want to emphasize that this is part of chapter 18 of the gospel according to spiritism. And on it, um, that is entitled, Many Are Called But Few Are Chosen, we will see the parable of the wedding feast, the narrow door, not all, all those who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, much will be asked of him who has received much. And then the Spirit's teachings, as we see on the gospel according to Spiritism, um, the information brought by the Spirits, um, one title, to him who already has, more will be given. Christians shall be recognized by their deeds. Right. So it's a very beautiful uh, chapter in terms of helping us recognize, are we worthy? Right? Are we there yet? What do we need to get to this um, wedding feast or perhaps this kingdom of God? Right. But again, just something to highlight here that we can study, study later on. As always, what I like to do is to make sure that we break it down into the parts. This is, a, 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 at least for me, and I hope that this helps you as well. Please let me know if it doesn't, <laughs> or if it does, we can even do more. Um, but breaking it down, the elements, it kind of really helps really engage with the elements in a separate way, as well as to once more emphasize the whole. What are the par parties involved outside the parable? This is outside of the parable, not within the parable, not the story that was told by Jesus, right? We have Jesus, and he's talking to them, right, the crowd. And there are certain instances, ins instances that we also are able to um, um, capture where Jesus was talking to the individuals, right, to the crowd, right? But that's not really mentioned here. There isn't a speculation um, uh, on this parable that the, the chapter that precedes, uh, precedes uh, Matthew 22 Jesus was actually talking to, or the verses in the chapter, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, right? And it, which makes sense, but we really don't need to go into detail on this because anytime we, it's okay to separate, to differentiate who he's talking to, to really help us understand and apply this to ourselves. Because there is a Pharisee inside of each one of us. There is a Sadducee inside of each one of us. And if we go to the gospel according to spiritism at the beginning, you will understand when Jesus was speaking a little bit better to those individuals and how he and the reason why or the reasons why he spoke in such a manner, because he knew the audience better than the audience knew themselves. And it's amazing because he will change. We will see that he, he changes. So Jesus was talking to, um, to the crowd. Continuing. Parties involved in the parable now, and it's quite a bit in the, you know, it's interesting Comparing the, this parable with the other ones, uh, this was pretty long. We have the king who wanted to throw the wedding feast, right? For the son, he utilizes of the servant, right? We have the invitees, them, those individuals who are, who are invited, right? We have the armies, 
that was sent to, to the invitees later on. And we have the murderers, which, in fact, they were the invitees, right? Now, they were not just invitees, but they were killing the servants of the king who were sent to call them to the feast, right? And I'm already thinking, why would you call, why would you kill someone who is inviting you for a, to a party, <laughs> right? It's, it's kind of weird, but we'll get there. And all whom you meet, everyone on the street, right? Because after the invitees did not want to go, what did the king say? You know what? Guess what? Those who were, who were invited, they were not worthy. Call everybody who you see now on the, on the street. Everything is ready anyway. So we're not just, we might as well not put it to waste, right? Um, and again, this just kind of creating ideas now. But, and then a man, the man at the end, who's not wearing a garment as well. There may be more, um, but this is, these are just some of the parties involved at the actual, um, in the parable. And the elements involved in the parable as well. So we have the kingdom of heaven, right? Which is um, uh, compared to the wedding feast, right? And we have the feast, we have the cattle, and whatever was ordered to be fattened. So here, I want to just make sure that it's not just the cattle. It's everything else that was actually prepared, ordered to be fattened for that actually feast. The house in the country, the business, the burned city, the crossroads and the streets, the wedding hall, at the table, and I add, I add the table as well, or at the table to make it a point at the end, and the outer darkness as well that we see at the end where that individual who was at the table and he did not have the garment, he's sent to that outer darkness, right? Continuing, what, are the lo what is the location? It's not disclosed, right? And there are many possibilities where he was talking to, but these once more were the teachings that Jesus were, was bringing to those individuals at the time. So who do the, um, what do the crowd really uh, represent for us? Who is the crowd? Since Jesus was speaking to the crowd. Who is the crowd? Mankind. Us. All of us. Right? It's all of us. And who does the man not wearing a wedding, gar wedding garment represent? Everybody's quiet. <laughs> Everybody's quiet. I'm going to throw everybody under the bus. Us. Everybody's like, no, not, oops, no, not me, not me, right? It's the big feet. Not me, right? But wait, because when we take a, a, a deeper or more careful look, we'll be like, hmm, this makes sense. Perhaps I'm there, right? Perhaps I wasn't prepared when I was called. Right. I was called. But when I was supposed to present myself, I was not fully prepared. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that, because one of the things that I want to parenthesis here and please pay attention to this part. Whenever we're studying this, it's not that we should have gotten this. Let's say. A million years ago. Right. Or 10 years ago. No. There's nothing wrong with that. There, there, there's, I shouldn't say, there's, there's nothing that really tells us that I should have been a better spirit or a better person uh, three months ago. I should have gotten uh, the invitation and gone to the wedding feast yesterday. No. Everything happens little by little. The changes happen little by little. If you start a, to brush your teeth only at 11 o'clock for, hopefully not, but for, let's say, and you do that for five months, I guarantee you, five months from now, if somebody tells you, go brush your teeth as you wake up in the morning, it's not going to happen. It may happen once, maybe twice a week, but you're going to have to break that cycle, right? It's going to take time. Imagine when we're talking about feelings, thoughts behaviors that has been, do, been done for not only this 
reincarnation, but several reincarnations. And you might ask yourself, but wait a minute, I've been, I'm doing the same things that I was doing the past reincarnations. Chances are, welcome to my world. Yes. <laughs> right? And once more, there's nothing wrong with that. On one side, it brings us the responsibility that we need to work hard in ourselves. On the other side, which is the most beautiful part of it, that God is great. And God will give us the time that we need, the resources that we need, the people that we need to change, right? When we can change. Just a parenthesis, so that we don't leave here and say, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, I wasn't ready, but that's the idea. So I want to kind of break down a little bit on, on the idea, but right now I want to really focus on the wedding feast. What is this commotion about a feast? Well, let's just jump, in, jump into it, a wedding feast. Think about it. I mean, Jesus used the, the, the wedding feast, right? The, he takes the, the kingdom of heaven, right, and compares to a wedding feast. Why? Analyzing this whole thing, studying a little bit, reading uh, quite a bit, we will see that weddings in the past, they were way different than our weddings nowadays. There was a whole preparation for the whole thing. Anytime we are um, throwing a party or hosting a party, I shouldn't say throw a party because that sounds a little bit weird, but hosting a party in our homes, what do we do? With number one, we prepare mentally, right? Spiritually as well, depending who's coming, especially, right? <laughs> you know, we, have, we want to be on our toes. We want to, you know, our family members also, those who will live with us to be on our toes as well. Everything, we're not going to, you know, say anything awkward and whatnot. You know, nowadays we have the issue of not talking politi politics, right? So all of these different things, we start preparing. And then we get that excitement. Oh, this is going to happen. What are we going to do? And then you start preparing, talking about the food. You're talking about the organization, how we will receive everyone at the house. No matter how, if this is small or large, but there is a preparation, right? And those who are involved hosting it, right, they're all combined. They're all in the same thought. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to act, which is a beautiful thing, right? When we have somebody at our homes, right? And the same thing we feel when we are going to someone, else, someone else's um, 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 party or feast, whatever that is, or just a, a simple dinner that everything is in place. And if it isn't, guess what? We do our best to help as well, right? But again, I want to just give this idea of pre preparation. But back then... The wedding was prepared as we see that the, the, the $100,000 for a whole year preparation for all these people, right? It's a lot of money. And this is for a union of a lifetime, right? But come to find out as we went deeper on this whole thing as well, that we're going backwards. That. There is a, 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 a study made by um, uh, in A Diamond is Forever and Other Fairy Tales, 2014, that a re there is a relationship on those who spend less money with their weddings, they tend to stick together longer or not file for divorce. Yes, it's, it goes backwards. So th for those who spend more than $20,000 on their wedding, they're 46% more likely to get to file divorce. Those with 10000 to 20000 29%, 5000 to 10000 is the preference point there that they put. Um, and then 1000 to 5000 18 um, less likely, 18% less likely. And then to $1,000, 53% less likely. So it's not the money. Right. Even though all the um, the wives would like to have had, you know, a beautiful, you know, fifty thousand dollars, one hundred thousand dollars wedding. But that doesn't. So what's the what's the point behind this? Is there a partnership? Or is it just the wedding? Because this is really is it relevant to a point? Yes. 
But the idea is for us to really think about, is there a partnership, right? Let's go back to the parable. So now I have some highlights in terms of the red, right? So we can dive into um, what the, um, the, the parable really is in terms of what we can do here. So we already talked about the wedding feast. We already know, um, you know what the, the wedding feast is. But why did Jesus use of this? Well, if we go back, and the gospel according to Spiritism has explained this quite a bit. Jesus was speaking to individuals that did not have the, the level of advancement that we have intellectually and morally as well. They were, don't take me wrong, they're very well-educated individuals at the time, but it's not like education had, you know, it, it was accessible as it is for us nowadays. So Jesus had to use of the customs. Jesus had to use of the, the, what people knew about it at the time in order for him to make correlations, right? To, for him to explain what the kingdom of God is, let's talk about the wedding feast, right? Where everybody's happy, right? Everybody's eating, everybody is, is well, right? Cared for, right? So this is something that we have to bring to context as well so we can understand this. So then we can then apply to our lives as well nowadays. So the other idea that it's important for us to, to think about it as well, Jesus was talking to individuals that they were polytheistics. They believed in many, many gods, right? And their ideals were not perhaps as we have nowadays, right? It was more to um, save their lives. <laughs> I was going to say something else. Save their lives. To maintain themselves alive, right? And to maintain their... their um, um, their, their loved ones alive as well. And the, the, the idolatry as well of several gods also um, made them very vulnerable in terms of whatever we see, whatever we hear, that's God, right? So all of these things we got to take in, in consideration. One of the beautiful things that happened at the time as well is that Hebrews, they were what? The first monotheistic individuals of earth, right? That's a huge leap that we have. And we're going to bring a passage from this beautiful book on the way to the light here soon. But let us understand the severity of what this is for us, right? We're talking about a civilization, the first civilization that is coming, a group of people that is coming and saying there is one God, right? Imagine if we were, we can use the lies of whatever it comes to mind. I mean, I don't have anything right now that I can do. An idea that pops up right now, right? Or somebody invites you to do something, right? We're going to be skeptical. Well, wait a minute. Well, what, is, what is this, right? And imagine that group of people, a, good, a great percentage saying, there is only one God, right? Do we think that everybody confirmed with that idea? No. If they did... Many like many like like many of us, perhaps you know, if we go to Brazil and you ask people, um, "What are you?" They're, I'm Catholic, but they've never been to church. It's like that confirmant. It's saying everybody's Catholic. Maybe I should say that I'm Catholic as well, right? Or my family members, they're Protestant. Yeah, you know, I. But they've never been to church. They've never been to a mass or whatnot. So it's 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 an outwardly confirmation then really the heart. It's the customs outside, right? But the contract is not inside of us. The partnership is not in our hearts. And I'm using words now that we were using before for us to understand this. So we go back and we, we look at it and say, wait a minute. So we're talking about the Hebrews. We're talking about the Jews at the time, right? And where is Jesus in this whole thing? Well, let me read this passage. I was going to read it later, but I think it's important just for us to. This is from, again, Emmanuel on the book, On the Way to the Light. This is um, him describing what he calls the choosing of Israel. He says the following. The tribes and lords and the Lord's messengers succeed one, an succeed one another in the kingdom of Israel. Its entire 
pathway was filled with prophetic and consoling voices regarding that one whom the world would glorify, glorify one day as the Lamb of God. Referring to Jesus. These are the prophets saying, there will be one that will come and he's going to be the messenger. Each century, the prophecies were renewed and each temple awaited the word of the order from heaven through the Savior of the world. The teachers of the law in the temple at Jerusalem, excuse me, I lost myself, respectfully discussed the divine missionary. In their proud vanity, they expected his arrival in a victory chariot to proclaim to all peoples the superiority of Israel and to perform all sorts of miracles and wonders. So they were expecting this Jesus that was going to be revolutionary. And he was, don't take me wrong, but not the way that they were thinking, right? To finalize, he says the following. Remembering these details of the, their history, we are naturally led to ask why Jesus prefer the tree of David to put his divine lessons for humankind into effect. But logic itself shows us that of all the peoples back then, Israel was the most faithful, but also the neediest. Given its exclusive, exclusive, excuse me, exclusivist, ex exclusivist and pretentious vanity, much will be asked of those, of, of the one who has received much. And the Israelites had received much from the Most High in matters of faith. Thus, it was only right that the corresponding degree of understanding would be expected of them in matters of hum humility and love. So they had a great sense of, of, of understanding in terms of faith. But their vanity really brought them to a position that they needed the most. Because Jesus could have come in among other people. But there he was. right? And this is, again, after all the different messengers saying, prepare yourself. He will come. Prepare yourself. He will come. He came. And what happened? Let's take a step back or several steps back. All these messengers came and what happened to them? They were murdered. And I don't want to say that, you know, if we go back to all these, these prophets, they were not necessarily physically murdered, but their idea was their thoughts was as well. It's like, okay, this person is saying this thing, whatever. I'm not going to worry about it, right? It's the same thing as, it's like us talking to our kids sometimes, right? <laughs> you say it once, and they murder whatever we say it. And I'm not calling them murder, but you get the point in terms of the severity of what is to come, especially when we're talking about our, our salvation, not in terms of somebody dying on the cross, but in terms of this will make my life as fulfilling as the wedding feast. Let's go back to the parable. Hopefully with this little explanation, we get a little bit better now of this passage. So, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanting to give his son a wedding feast sent his servants to call all to call on those whom the, he, he had invited. Excuse me. However, they refuse to come. Those, the servants, we already talked about it, were these prophets. These individuals that came and prepared us. Right? Those whom he had invited. The Hebrews. Those are the first individuals, or if we go back to this actual book, we will learn that the Hebrews were a group of people from another planet, from Capella. That's a topic for another discussion, another day, that had this great faith, had a great understanding of religiosity. Let's call not just let, let us not just call religion, religiosity in, in general, right? 
They were monotheistic as well. They believed in one God, which was revolutionary for the time, but their vanity was up here, way higher than what they could really conquer. And more we need to, we need to read more and we need to dive into more, but I want us to at least dive back into who is being invited here, right? However, they refused to come. The king sent them, sent all their servants with orders. Now it's not just, uh, okay, go and invite them. Now you have an order. Now your the determination is completely different, right? That's why I highlighted there as well, right? To tell the invitees, I have prepared the feast. I have slaughtered my cattle and, I, and uh, what I have ordered to be fed. Now there is an order to say, come. Because if you don't come, things are going to get worse. And look what I, what I have on the table for you. Again, at that time, we could not really process food like we process nowadays. So if you have a feast, you want to go, you want to eat. Because <laughs> you don't know when that feast will happen again. And we start going deeper. I hope you get the point because it's like Jesus not spending just words. I mean, he's really, there's a point behind this, right? I have slaughtered my cattle and what I have ordered to be fed. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. However, they were not concerned. And one went to his house in the country and another to his business. They were not concerned. They're like, okay, I, I know better, right? I know how to dress. And I'm now going a little bit deeper into what the gospel according to spiritism also tells us, the Pharisees and the Sadducees as well, right? There were different groups of, of um, Hebrews or uh, uh, Jews, but they have peculiarities, right? The... the the, the Pharisee with their garments, with their outer religiosity, right? Showing to others that they knew quite a bit. And they did. They did. But it was more an outward type of um, religiosity, of faith, right? The heart, there was no contract whatsoever with God. And they imposed this on others in such a way that they were in certain form. They were detested by other groups as well, right? And the Sadducees, they're skeptical. They just, whatever, right? So some of them, like many of us today, they had their excuses. I need to take care of my business. I have to work tomorrow, <laughs> right? Is this going to end? Or if I sit down and, and, and read this book, Ah, no, but I can watch TV. I have to do stuff at home. And don't take me wrong, folks. We, we all have to live this physical life. But how many excuses, just like them, we also put in our lives? When we are being called to do something different with our lives, right? The house in the country <laughs> with the vacations, right, of life. And there's nothing wrong with vacation. I love them, especially when you call Leo to the beach. I'm there before you are, right? But what about the moments that we are in a meeting or that we are doing something useful for our lives, but in our minds, we are wandering in the vacations of life, right? In the craziness of life as well. In the business that, in fact, we have to take care of. So this did not only happen then, but happens nowadays. Not, a, not, not put into this whole thing over here that, you know, we're being called as well by several servants, right? When somebody calls us, oh, would you, can you help me with, you know, something that I, I need help at home? And we're not talking about religiosity of being a servant or being somebody who is kind, right? Or we need to feed somebody. That's a calling, Right? The other seized his servant and killed them after having badly mistreated them. We already mentioned how many times we are called, the servants, they come, and we mistreat them. 
and we truly mistreat them, sometimes verbally, sometimes intentionally or not, whatever they may be, right? Sometimes it's just a simple conversation. I, I, I've been analyzing quite a bit at work and, and, and you know, it's the psychology that, that Joanna DeAngelis, along with spiritism, comes and starts knocking on our door. I, Leo, tend to say things to people that will confirm with my ideas because it's convenient to me. People will come and say things to me that they know that I will agree with them. Because the moment that I don't agree with them, it's not going to happen. The moment that the persons know, or I, I know that if I come to Louise and say, Louise, you, I'm going through this trouble. And Louise will say, okay, Leo, but I don't agree with your idea of, on how to resolve the issue. That will be the last time I'll talk to him about my problems. Because he's not confirming with me, he's not agreeing with me on my ideals, right? Don't worry about it. It's it's up front there, the camera. So when we look at these things and we say the service they come and we don't agree with them, guess what? We push them aside, right? We badly mistreat them, especially when there is something, again, related to our exaltation towards God, right? Our, our elevation towards God as well. When the king found out, he was filled with anger and having sent his armies, he exterminated those murderers and burned their cities. Now, with spiritism nowadays, we were, quote unquote, helped to understand that would be a very vengeful God, right? Because we're talking about the king being the God, right? Exterminates, exterminating all of us. If we are giving the resources, if we're giving the capabilities to do A, B, C, and we, not, we don't make ourselves worthy of it, guess what? We lose it. Where do we learn this? this? The parable of the talents. What happens to the, to the one who buried that one talent? He lost it. Simple as that. So the extermination here is, okay, you were given this opportunity, and it's not like there will be other opportunities in the future, but this one, wasted. So when we're talking about the burning the city, we have, we, see, we have seen several different groups of people, civilizations being burned down to the ground. And where are they now? Right? The Romans. Right? And we see this happening over time. And then we see this happening with ourselves as well. Right? The, hopefully... Uh, the Leo today is a different Leo than yesterday. And a, a lot was burned down, right? To say, I, we need to bring it to the ground so that we can build something new as well, right? So there's nothing, law of transformation, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But it, was, it happened because the way they act, the way they um, propose the idea to themselves. Moving on. He then said to his servants, the wedding feast has been fully prepared, but those who had been invited were not worthy of it. Just as we mentioned. Look, they were prepared. As Emmanuel said, the Hebrews at the time, they were prepared. They had a great knowledge. But when they were called, they did not show up. So, consequently, not worthy of it. We were studying chapter 10 of book, The Messengers. All right. And we see the discussion of, um, I was prepared, you know, for my reincarnation to do ABC work, right? But I was not worth of it. It's not that he, try, he didn't try. He tried, but did not utilize the resources as he, what's his name again? Please help me. And I actually studied, Ot Otavio, no, well, not Otavio. And I, and I presented the chapter, <laughs> I'm making a fool myself. No, no, this is, this, is, this is chapter 10. I forget the name now. But we see this idea of not being worthy now, right? A little bit more clear that there was a preparation. It came from another constellation with a lot of baggage, good baggage as well. 
but did not know how to utilize here, right? So go to the crossroads and call to the wedding feast all whom you meet. The servants then went into the streets and gathered all those they, they met, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with people who sat at the table. So imagine now these servants going to the street and say, come, there is a wedding feast. Going to other um, locations, other towns and whatnot, call, bringing everybody in. Because those individuals who were invited didn't come. So we're talking about the good and the bad. This parable, if we go deeper and deeper on it, we will see good people, scholars talking about and, and analyzing this, 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 um, this wedding feast or this parable as a calling for everybody, that the kingdom of God is for everybody. And it is. Don't take me wrong. I'm not doubting what it, Jesus also mentioned here in terms of the idea that it's for everyone. But not everybody is ready right and that's what we're going to see we see as well in the whole chapter of, of the gospel according to spiritism not everybody's ready and because we're not ready we create chaos let's imagine ourselves here in a getting to a wedding right now this is just the reception right we're not even talking about the food yet or where we're going to sit right imagine ourselves in this beautiful gathering right now everybody's standing there's that all that commotion What's going on? You don't know where you're going to sit. You know, where are the people that you know, right? You want to sit next to the people that really agrees with you, <laughs> right? Or you know them because you don't want to be left, you know, out, right? And there's all that commotion. Now, imagine having people from everywhere. Joel, 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 thank you, Joel. Imagine having people from everywhere, people that you don't know. I mean, these are different villages. These are different crossroads, as he's saying here, right? Imagine the chaos. Let's hold that idea, and then we're going to come back, okay? The kingdom, the, the king then entered to see those who were at the table, and noticing a man who was not wearing a wedding garment, he said to him, my friend, why have you come in without a wedding garment? Well, we just said it, right? If you're calling people from outside, not necessarily you're going to get individuals understanding the actual celebration. I would like to say, not a celebration, but the event in itself or the severity of the event. Because we're not talking, when I say severity, you know, it may sound a little bit severe, <laughs> right? Redundancy here. But the seriousness of the event. It's a wedding feast. We're celebrating what? The partnership of two individuals. And the idea here is celebrating the partnership of us and God, right? So they don't know. So they're going to come whichever way. That doesn't mean that the king was not nice enough to say, call everybody, bring everybody in. And I'm quite sure that the servant says, this is a wedding feast, by the way. Make sure you dress appropriately, right? But they didn't. They were like, whatever. Because of the level of understanding of where they're going to, they, they don't know, right? So who is at fault, you may ask? Well, the king did what he was supposed to do. He called everyone. But there is a responsibility on us. Right. If I'm going to the center, like I said, I love the beach, but I cannot be wearing flip flops. <laughs> right. At least I have to shave, do the things that I have to do, you know, to be considered appropriate. <laughs> right. To go to the spirit, the center. And it's the same thing. If we go to a wedding, we're going to put a nice suit in respect to the family. Right. It would be nice if we go back to 1930s and everybody even come to the center in suit, right? The hat and everything. I love those, um, those old pictures, but I digress. Anyways, so this man does not have a garment. And look what he says afterwards. The man remained silent. So anytime you're asked or I'm asked, 
Why did this happen? What do we do? When, now let me, here's the caveat. What we do when the heart is hurting or when we know that we, and we understand that we did something wrong, what do we do? <laughs> Go to the spirit center. Okay, got it. Great. But we side on ourselves, right? We don't know what to say. We do not know what to say. If we are reactive, we haven't gotten yet. And we, if we're reactive and, and we start, you know, mumbling words or saying or, um, um, you know, pushing, you know, blame into someone else on something that we did or we some, on something that we didn't do, because in this case, he didn't prepare himself, right? He would be blaming somebody, but he quieted himself. He silent himself. And when we, when we read the rest, it says, Then the king told his servants, Bind his hands and feet and cast him into outer darkness. There, there shall be weeping and garnishing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. What happens to us naturally after we truly understand we messed up? What happened to Joe? Regret, guilt, remorse. And this is, again, after doing some analysis on this thing, by reading other scholars as well, because by far I'm not one, it's exactly what's shown here. It's this outer darkness that we go into, right? Even though here we see the king saying, throw him there, but we do it to ourselves. The king of our hearts said, look, you messed up. And that's why we need help. And that's why we need to come to the Spirit Center, right? Because we, for, well, there, there, wait until the next slide. We'll get to the miracle. But it's for us to understand that the, the harsh words that are being used, it's happening to us right now. The servants are being sent. Jesus has been sent. And we still don't accept Jesus to the fullest, right? I don't. I don't understand. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of the things that I, I'm still trying to grasp it, right? The cures, the teachings, all these things. And as much as I read more, more I want to read, more I want to understand, right? Because they have been sent. And he comes every single day. Sometimes we use the cross. Sometimes we use this. Sometimes we use the, the different artifacts that we create in our minds, in our, in our hearts. And we still haven't understand yet. And like I said at the beginning, there's nothing wrong with that. The only issue is that how much are we truly trying to get to it? How much are we preparing ourselves to be worthy, number one, of the way to be called or to become an invitee, right? To be invited to this wedding feast and to be worthy as well when we get there because we're truly, fully prepared. And this fully prepared I like to give the example of the, the different apostles. I mean, you look at Peter, and we look at Matthew. We look at the, Paul, for example, right? Was he ready right at first? No. Imagine how much it took to get to that point. And we can translate this into our reincarnations, the different callings that we receive. Two more examples I would like to bring so we can move on. And this is something that crossed my mind as well as we were studying this. Our parents, they're servants of God, and we deny them. Denying them, we're denying God, right? Our older brothers, or somebody, a brother or sister that comes to us and gives us, Leo, you need to do this differently. Or perhaps stop doing this, right? Right? And, and, and sometimes we, are, uh, we receive that um, unwanted um, 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 coaching, if you will, but they give it to us. And we just push them aside. There's a flip side to this as well. Well, not a flip side, but there's a, something else that I was thinking about it. What about the limitations that we have in life? 
Have we ever thought about them being servants in our lives? Think of the things that we want to have materially and we not, we're not able to have. Or perhaps a skill that we want to develop, but we cannot develop the skill because we have to take care of someone else. These frust frustrations that we have in life, perhaps they are servants. Because if we have accessibility to them, guess what? We would get ourselves in trouble. We would be perhaps murdering other servants. But they come. Sometimes we accept them well. Sometimes we don't. But we deal with them. But they're also servants. Right? Much like when our mother said, don't do this. <laughs> You're going to get in trouble. Don't do it. And we do it. It's the limitation that we were given to take a step back and think twice, but impulsively we go and do it. So think of the limitations as well as servants and bless them, bless them. I brought this idea here so we can kind of grab everything and put everything together because I think Emmanuel um, hits on the nail on the head again with this message. Uh, entitled Divine Grafting. Does, any, does, every, does anyone or everybody know what grafting is? I didn't. All right. Grafting is when you take a plant or a small tree and you cut a piece of it and you actually bring another piece of another tree, right, and put it together. That is grafting. In Shirtu. Thank you. Yeah. And there are, diff there, are, there are different types of grafting, by the way. If we Google, um, um, we can um, research it. I shouldn't say Google. Research it. Because <laughs> there are all the types of research, right? But um, we will see that uh, there, there are beautiful um, ways to make uh, perhaps the, the tree, number one, grow um, more effectively or more rapidly. Uh, but also the fruits, you know, they tend to get a different taste, sweeter. The idea is to be sweeter or sometimes make it bitter as well. And when we talking about grafting is, again, it's another um, uh, work that was done back in Jesus' time as well. For what? For the grapes, right? Right. So we get different types of grapes as well, right? If a tree was developing, right, but didn't develop enough, let me go ahead and put another part of another tree here so it kind of gives that boost, right? But the tree have to be there. So let's look what Emmanuel tells us in this idea. And it's interesting because I did not know what grafting was. And I'll confess to you guys, I went to, I was like, wow, this is great. But this was actually the gospel at home message of our past Tuesday. So Emmanuel says the following. By the way, it's actually um, um, from a passage from the letters, um, one of the letters of Paul to the Romans, 1123, when he says, And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Okay? Emmanuel says the following, Every human being is actually a spiritual plant, an object of great care, on the part of the divine sower. Each person, life, uh, the plant, live the, excuse me here, I, I, has different, like the plant, excuse me, each person, like the plant, has different phases of existence. Sowing, germination, fertilization, growth, usefulness, blooming, fructification, and harvest. Shortly before the fruit appears, the fruit grower is more carefully devoted to the tree. Likewise, a, the Lord adopts the same rules for us in this spiritual struggle. As we acquire knowledge, reason, experience, the heavenly fruit grower confers on us invaluable resources of spiritual grafting with a view to our purification for life eternal. On each new day of our human experience, you receive invaluable resources so that the results of your current incarnation may enrich you with divine light by mean of the happiness you transmit to others. However, you are a conscious tree, 
and are free to accept or not renew an element. And you are free to acknowledge their blessing or reject it. Carefully reflect on how many times the sublime sower has called you to grow spiritually. Heaven's grafting in searches for us in a thousand ways. Today, it may be found in an edifying converse conversation. Tomorrow, it may be found in an instructive book. The day after that, it may be found in an apparently insignificant gift that comes your way. So if you intend to grow spiritually, take advantage of heaven's contributions, illuminating and sanctifying your inner temple. But if this belief is currently isolating your mind, winding your energies around the reel of selfishness and, excuse me, the grafting in of sublimation will search for you in vain. Since in the area of spirit, you still do not produce the sap that favors the abundant life. How many times we have been called? How many times we have received that extra arm, <laughs> right? We were talking about this, right? How many times we have given that set, second set of eyes by someone else? The servants of the parable. How many times the limitations came and say, don't do it. And we went ahead anyways. How many times again, we were sitting at, seated at the table and we were not fully clothed. So if I ask you again, the man that did not have the garment, who, do they, who does he represent? Makes sense now? <laughs> Is there anybody denying it? Right? I remember um, Carol Strohsnyder, one of our friends of the SSP, um, one time she posed to us the question of uh, how should, oh, I think she mentioned that, it's not, she didn't pose the question, she mentioned to us that when she's going to have her God at home, she dresses. She cannot do the God at home on her pajamas or something, right? She at least puts something um, decent, right? Because she's like, you know, my mantra's coming and I don't want them to see me like, <laughs> like oh, really? <laughs> but it was a cute and funny thing, but let's prepare ourselves. Right? If we want to make this, this communication as effective as possible, let's prepare ourselves. How do we know, how can we believe that, that my mentor is going to come and talk to me more directly, let's say, when I, inside of me I have, I hate my neighbor, I hate my brother, my mother, my father, whoever that is. And it's not gonna, it's not here, I'm not here to say that we're not going to have um, let's say, misunderstandings, right? Or go through difficult times in life. But if that is the only thing that is consuming our minds and our hearts, guess what? That connection is not going to happen. We're not going to be, we're going to be at the table waiting for them, but we're not going to be worthy. We're not going to be ready, right? So when we read this Oh, gosh, where is it? This beautiful parable. Do, I know. Okay. So are we really um, paying attention to only who Jesus was speaking to? The Pharisees, the Sadducees? No, he's talking to us. And it is right now, right? So I hope that we get the message. As, as difficult as it is to talk about a parable where people is killing one another, right? Like a horror movie. But it's important for us to really pay attention and, and uh, share with ourselves first as we study and share with one another too. Daniel, do we have time for questions? Or comments? <laughs> Where's your charger? It's 2023. You're sitting at the table, but you're not ready. No, I'm <laughs> and then, I'm joking with Daniel. Daniel, I'm just joking. Um, 
uh, I'm just, um, you know, it's funny because it's coming from Daniel as well. He always have a plan B, but he, I think he already exhausted the plan B. And thank you for that, Daniel. Any comment? Any? You have a, he has, she has a bank. <laughs> if there is a will, there is a way. <laughs> um, anybody has a question, a comment that perhaps you would like to share? Kirsten. Let me pull up my list of questions that I made, Leo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what would be in modern terms or in modern times, the equivalent of the wedding feast, do you think? You know, that crossed my mind too, believe it or not, but I do not know. Um, I think it all depends on what we have in our hearts, right? Much like the teaching of the gospel according to spiritism for us to pay attention to where our hearts is, right? There will be, right? And, and this is in life, physical life, as well as in the spiritual life. I think it has to, um, it, it kind of guides us in this, uh, with, with this question. Um, knowing you a little bit, what I would say happiness for you right now as a mother is the happiness of, of your kids, right? So we would compare of that togetherness, right? You calling everyone to come as you have done, you know, for me as well, go for, you know, to the, the pool because that is happiness for you. That is your, my God, the ultimate thing at this moment. And this is beautiful as well because not necessarily, um, it's it's something that is going to happen then. It's it's your moment right now, and that will change later on, right? Because they're going to grow. They're going to be sufficient enough, you know, to live their lives, right? So the wedding feast of lives they change. They should change, right? Much like the actual wedding feast now has a different connotation, right, to all of us. But each one of us will have what is of content, of validity in our hearts. Right. When we get to to study a book like Jeanette and I were talking earlier about, you know, studying this book or that book or, you know, discovering something, what we tend to do, we rush to everyone. Right. Sometimes we want to push, through, you know, on people like impose on people. You got to read this. You got to you know watch this movie or whatnot. Right. So it's the same thing. <clears throat> right. Um, in terms of society. It's pretty sad that we don't have anything that collectively we like to share, right? Um, and I know this has to do with customs. This has to do with uh, uh, the, the, the group of people that we belong, right? Um, if you were to ask Brazilians, oh gosh, <laughs> whether it's feijoada, imposing de queijo, right? All those things that there will be, right? So I think that depends on where you are, the time, and... Uh, and I say time is not the time of 2023, right? But really the time of our lives, right? What makes, you know, um, sense for us right now. So I hope that answers your question. Um, and, and again, I think this is beautiful because that is what brings us together, right? Looking at you right now, since I use the example, I'll use you again uh, in a respectful way. You know, I, I take my head out because, you know, my kids are grown and, and it's like, wow, this is a very, very tough moment. So we pray for one another, right? We, we wish one another well, right? Whenever we can, we go and help, right? Much like I need the help right now with the struggles that I'm going through, right? Because the wedding's feast, don't take me wrong, prepare your, to prepare a wedding, it's not easy. It's a lot of work. So I hopefully, and hopefully that helps. No, definitely. Thank you. Anyone else? Any comments? You want to pass it? I just wanted to say thanks for the explanation because I never um, understood the parable and it, the context in which it was um, given. So for me, uh, just putting it in context and uh, and explaining what the feast is and who the servants and the invitees. Uh, were that 
really help. One comment I might want to make at the end regarding that last person where you, you know, the one that's cast out, where you said it's all of us. And my thought was it's not necessarily, it, it is all of us, but it, I just thought for me, the better way to understand it was it's any of us. Mm -hmm. you know? There's a slight difference there. So, because there's some, I guess there's some people that won't be cast out. So instead of all of us, I would say any of us. Right. Thank you, and, and thanks for that correction. And and that is that is much like I was talking, uh, you know, with Kirsten in terms of you know how we live. I think it would be the the better word in terms of in 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 relation to that. You're right, in any of us, right? Because each one of us, we're going through our own struggles, right? Each one of us, we are called for different tasks, for different feasts, not necessarily a wedding feast, but a feast that is has a great importance as well. And we don't make ourselves, um, we don't prepare ourselves fully enough for that moment. So that in fact can be any of us, right? And, and, and again, to the point is that the, the, the callings are different. The moments are different, right? So I can never say that, you know, the same, you, re you will receive the same calling that I'm receiving. Putting a, a talk like this together, it is a calling. Right. I have a wife that she actually asked, you know, what's going on? And I'm thinking <laughs> and my and my face expression is like, oh, gosh, what am I going to say? Right. And I get super worried. Um, and, and it's and she's asking, like, well, if I explain this to her, it's for her, it will not have the same meaning. Right. But it is an express. It, it is a, um, um, a calling. Right. It is a servant that comes and say, pay attention to what you're going to say. Right. So. All of these things, and, and again, I'm not just saying that, oh, I'm giving a talk. No, because perhaps we have to give the talk with someone at work, kids, right? The husband, the wife, all of these things. And life in general, ourselves. When we are, that negative thought comes, the servant comes and say, don't, don't go there. <laughs> and we have to police ourselves, right? So thank you for the um, uh, the the ideas and, you know, how we actually um, really uh, present ourselves in terms of who we're called or not. Kirsten, here. We have a question from Yasko. She says, hi, Leo. In this parable, the king representing God seems too vengeful. How would we interpret it more correctly? Who was revengeable? I'm sorry. The king in, this, in the parable was very vengeful because he had the people who who uh killed right or something okay so she's asking Howdy. yeah yeah she said Sorry. no it's okay um where is it uh, she said in the parable the king representing god seems to be too vengeful so how do we how would we interpret it more correctly since god obviously is not vengeful number one the first thing that comes to mind is for us to understand and go back to who Jesus was speaking to. He had to bring a king that was, look, he's going to put you in your place, right? That symbol, that look, this is, this, is, this is what people related to, right? It was the custom of the time that a king, the, the man of the house, let's, put, let's, let's take a step back. The, the person representing the, the, the house, right? Once he said something, that was it. It was patriarchal. That's it. I mean, th there's nothing going above that last word, right? Imagine the king. It was someone who was really imposing, right? It's that individual that perhaps just by looking at it, we're like, no, oh, right? And today we understand that we're just... We are at that position, right? Not as a king, but, uh, well, perhaps as a king as well. But, you know, when we are, oh, I am, you know, who are you? Well, I'm Leo, <laughs> right? But right now I work as so and so, as, as, as in this position at my job, right? So that's number one for us to really understand who Jesus was talking to and how we connect with this today. I would say that that king sometimes, it's inside of us. 
this God that this king is representing, it's inside of us. It's our belief of God. It took the first revelation with Moses to present this God that was very strict, right? And then Jesus comes and says, my father. There was another leap in society as well, much like the Hebrews as the first monotheistic um, group of people on earth. And then Jesus come and say, the father, God, the father, right? And we still don't see as the father, the father that wants us as a, to receive the, this wedding feast, right? We sometimes settle to go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> it is true. Think about it, right? We settle for something. No, I want the best food. I want the best meal of my life, right? That God is inside of us. So it's a matter of how we actually uh, allow that to either get out of our lives and really understand that God in a different, hopefully, Yasku, this helps um, because I would believe that that's how we need to deal with it, right? To really understand who Jesus was talking to and then how we are um, bringing that inside of us as well. So I just wanted to add a little bit on the uh, uh, um, answer Comment? to Yasko is that also Jesus could not have a reference different what the people could not give know. a reference. For example, I'm going to make an example. We cannot tell our dogs how computer works because it's not they, it's not part of their their daily life. So mm -hmm. get a powerful entity in that time was the king. So there is not all the way that Jesus could bring to explain to us about how powerful God it is, but get something that we already know. Right? Yeah. So I think that that explain um, why they need to use some features that we will relate to. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and one thing that I would add, and thank you, Daniel, for that, is also language also was limited, right? So we have to, and then nowadays we have spiritism that brings to us that God is what? The first cause of all things, <laughs> right? First cause of all things. It's beautiful, very short. Right. Very simple. Um, and we understand very little still. Very, very little. And the, 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 the final thing that I would like to, since we were talking about God, is that the reminder that he is the way, the truth and the life through him. We'll get there. Right. It's not to the many titles that I have, the so many reincarnations in this or that position that I have. But. The good inside of me will take me there, right? So that we habilitate ourselves that with the idea that without charity, there is no salvation, which is exactly what it said um, at the end of the comment of this parable in the gospel according to spiritism, that if we have that in our hearts, we will be participating to this wedding feast. Right? So thank you for uh, the time to be heard and uh, uh, to share this with you. And we will... Um, continue with our meeting for our prayer and passes as well.